previously on Virtual Teen Classic Graphic Novel Reading. Hello, Teen Zone fans. It's Mr. Tony, also known as Chap in the Cap. I might have forgotten to mention that last time when you saw me do the first couple chapters of Mouse, which we we're going to continue today. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started on that. And I'm going to screen share for a moment here as soon as I find where's that screen share? Where are you at? There you are. Okay, and we're gonna get that slideshow going. And I'm gonna share that right now. All right, so got our handy dandy magnifying glass here. Gonna get started on chapter three of Mouse. I don't know if you remember, let me give you a real quick recap here on what happened last time, okay? So we know from the introduction that this basically is a story that is told between father and son. The son is a cartoonist. He's also the author of this book. Uh, his name is Art Spiegelman. And his dad uh, was a, a Jewish man that was imprisoned during the Second World War. And this essentially is the father telling the son the story about his early life before the son was born and during the war, what we call the Second World War. So, keep it now. Now, as the story is being told, uh, what you will see in the graphics is a rendition of the father telling the son the story. So, you'll see them both, and then the story reverting back to the actual happenings of the father uh, as a young man. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start the show. And I'm gonna be using this magnifying, this fancy magnifying glass here to uh, highlight the cells as we go ahead and, and read the story, okay? All right, let's get started here. Chapter three of Mouse, Prisoner of War. So here we go. I visited my father more often in order to get more information about his past. Yes, look, you don't eat anything. No thanks, I've had enough. So that's, uh, that's Art visiting his dad and having supper with them. Let's go, let's go ahead and continue. So finish at least what's on your plate. Okay, okay, see, see the old man, keep in mind now, the father was in a concentration camp and food was a scarcity. So I think by the look on his face, you, you get the idea. He's not too, uh, <laughs> he's not too happy with leaving food behind. All right. I'm just, I'm going to quit interrupting and just tell the story, okay? Let's go continue reading. You know, Mala, 
When I was little, I didn't eat everything mom served. Pop and I would argue till I ran to my room crying. You should know it's impossible to argue with your father. Mom would offer to cook something I liked better, but Pop just wanted to leave the leftover food around until I ate it. <laughs> Sometimes he even, he'd even save it to serve it again and again until I'd eat it or starve. Yes, so it has to be, always, you must eat all what is on your plate. Ah, Vladik. Fortunately for me, mom would eventually feed me something I liked and throw away the old food while you weren't looking. Yes, Anya was too easy with you always. Hmm. Thanks for dinner, Mala. It was delicious. She, the chicken was, I thought, too dry. Come, we'll talk better in the living room. Okay, I'll get my notebook. I tell you, with Mala, I don't know what to do. She, Pop, please, Pop. I'd rather not hear all that again. Tell me about 1939 when you were drafted. 1939, yes. We were given army trainings for a few days and then by the start of September, we were on a frontier. We were all digged into trenches near the river. On the other side, it was Germans. It was everything quiet until near morning. Wait a minute, you only train, they only trained you for a few days before sending you into combat? Well, the first time I went into the army for 18 months when I was 21. Then every four years, I went to Lubbock for a month to train. You know, my father tried to keep all his children out from the army because when he was young, he had then to go into the Russian army and there they took you for 25 years to Siberia. My father pulled out 14 of his teeth to escape. If you miss 12 teeth, they let you go. So when my brother Marcus got 21 years, father put him on a starvation diet. Always Mar Marcus was sickly, so thin. And when he went for the army examination, they didn't take him. A year later, when it came my turn, father didn't want to make me to go the same thing. It was something terrible. Three months before the examination, he started with me. Wake up, Vladik. You're sleeping too much. Only three hours a night. Stop, Vladik. You mustn't eat so much. But I'm hungry. Okay, have one more herring. Three months, I ate only salted herring and no water to lose weight. And a few days before the exam, no sleep and no food. Good boy, just a little more coffee. Only a gallon of coffee a day for my heart. And when finally I went for my medical examination, here's a healthy one. Um, no, there seems to be something wrong with him. Build yourself up for a year, young man, and we'll review your case again. The next year, father wanted, I beg, I would again do the same thing, but I begged him 
and went in 1922 to the army. But let's get back to 19, 1939. Yes, you see how you, how you mix me up? In 1939, we were on the frontier, digged into trenches by the river. It was quiet until near morning when I heard shooting on both sides. An officer sneaked over to me. Dig in deeper. You'll get killed. Your gun is cold. Why aren't you shooting? I didn't see at what to shoot. Cop, cop, cop. But I digged deeper and started to shoot. Then my, then bullets came in my direction. Bing! I dug deeper my trench, but I stopped to shoot. Why should I kill anyone? But when I looked in my gun, I saw a tree. And the tree was actually moving. I must be seeing things. How can a tree run? Well, if it moved, I had to shoot. Ugh. It held up a hand to show it was hurt to surrender. But I kept shooting and shooting until finally the tree stopped moving. Who knows? Otherwise, he could have shot me. two hours of fighting, the Nazis overcame our side of the river. You see the Nazis, they're, they're, they're the cats. So you got the Jews are mice, and the Germans are cats. Get up! Give me your gun! It's hot! You were shooting at us! My commander made me shoot! I only fired in the air. I answered, the, I answered in German, and his partner stopped him from beating me. They marched me to where it was more like me, war prisoners. And all from us that weren't injured, they marched over to their side of the river to look for dead soldiers. Attention! All prisoners will carry our dead and wounded to the waiting Red Cross trucks. You, where do you think you're going? I, I thought I saw a body over by the river. I knew where the one I shot would, should be laying. Yes, here! it. His blood ran out. Carry him over to the truck with the others. His name was Jan. And I knew that I killed him. And I said to myself, well, at least I did something. took us to a place near Nuremberg where it was many war prisoners. The Jews, they made to stand separate. It's all your fault, this war. You should, we should hang you right here on this spot. Put down all your valuables. He came up to me. I had maybe 300 zlotties. Why so much money, Jew? Many others had only five or six zlotties. You expect to do some business here? Show me your hands. 
You never worked a day in your life. Like you, Artie. My hands were always very delicate. Well, Jew, don't worry. We'll find work for you. They did. Another German took four or five of us from to a stable. See this mess? It better be spotlessly clean in one hour. Understand? It was impossible to do it in one hour. We really worked very hard. But an hour later, so not finished yet. This will cost you your soup, you lazy bastards. Somehow, we did make the job in only an hour and a half. But look what you do, Art. Look what you do, Artie. Huh? You're dropping on the carpet cigarette ashes. You want it should be like a stable here? Oops, sorry. Clean it, yes. Otherwise, I have to do it. Mala could let it sit like this for a week and never touch it. And she knows how with my sickness, it's hard now for me to do such things. Okay, okay, it's clean. So we lived and worked for a few weeks in the stable until they took us to an even bigger prisoner of war camp. Arr, Polish prisoners get heated cabins. Yes, and we're just left to freeze in these tents. To keep warm, we had only our summer uniforms and a thin blanket, at least if they gave us enough to eat. The other prisoners get only two meals a day. No, oh, sorry about that. Let me read that again. The other prisoners get two meals a day. We Jews get only a crust of bread and a little soup. Good morning, Vladek. Where are you going? To bathe in the river. You've gone crazy. Brr. I'll be clean and I'll feel warm all day by comparison. Many other, many others got frostbite wounds and, and the wounds was pus and the pus was lice. Every day I bathed and did gymnastics to keep strong and every day we prayed. I was very religious and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't else to do. Often we played chess to keep our minds busy and make the time go. I had a set made from stones and breadcrumbs. And one time a week, we could write letters through the International Red Cross. Dear Anya, I am fine, I miss you. Only in German and very carefully. And through this, it came a package. Chocolate bar, cigarettes, jam. It was so treasuring for me, this package. I had a sign my family was safe. And because I never smoked, I had cigarettes to trade for food. And so things went for maybe six weeks. Then, look, there's an announcement outside. Workers needed. War prisoners may volunteer for labor assignments to replace German workers called to the front. Housing and abundant food will be supplied. It's a trick. Never volunteer. If we have to die, 
Let's die here. No! I didn't agree. I'm not going to die, and I won't die here. I want to be treated like a human being. When my comrades saw I was, I was going, they too registered. We were right away sent to a big German company. We were taken to nice wooden houses. We got soup and we got bread. Look, a stove and real beds with sheets and pillows. And for a whole day, we only rested and got back our strength. Ah, uh, it seems like years since I've felt warm or been in a bed. Yes, funny, isn't it? It's only a little over two months since we were drafted. I'm worried though, Vladik. Who knows what kind of work they'll give us. It doesn't matter. Anything is better than rotting in those tents. I suppose. The next day we were given shovels and picks. Things what we never had held in our hands before. And the work was really very hard. We had to move mountains. The hills were maybe three or four yards high. We had to make it level. Some complained. Those what were too old or weak for such work? I, I can't take it anymore. Worthless Jew. If you're unhappy, go back to the POW camp. It's okay. We'll help you when no one is looking. We tried to help, but what you, what you think? Some went back to the tents to freeze and to starve. But what happened to them? I don't know. Still, 80% stayed. There was enough to eat and a warm bed. It was better to stay. Always I went to sleep exhausted. And one night I had a dream. Don't worry. A voice was talking to me. It was, I think, my dear grandfather. Don't worry, my child. It was so real, this voice. You will come out of this place free on the day Parsha's, on the day of Parsha's Truma. I woke up right away. And when I went to sleep again, it was par Parsha's Truma. Parsha's Truma. So what's Parsha's Truma? Each week on Saturday, we read a section from the Torah. This is so-called a Parsha. In one week each year, it is Parsha's Truma. Before we work, a few from us prayed. It was a rabbi there with us. One moment, rabbi. When will we read Parsha's Truma? Parsha's Truma? In the middle of February? Almost three months from now. Why? Three months in every day was for us a year. I told him my dream. Let's hope it's true. I'm afraid we'll never get out of here. So we worked day after day. We survived week after week the same. Until one time, look, soldiers! It came very many Gestapo and Wehrmacht. Attention! 
Line up on the road in two rows immediately. We were not at ease. We didn't know what they could do with us. I stood in the second line. Splatic. I didn't want they should see me much. Someone sneaked next to me. Rabbi, do you know what day it is? Saturday, of course. But do you know what a Saturday? It's Parsha's Truma. They marched us to the main courtyard and lined us by alphabet at tables. Name and rank. Spiegelman, Vladek, Corporal. Destination upon release, Soznovis. This the Germans did very good. To my wife and child, always they did everything very systematic. Very well, I signed this release form. And it was all done in one day. Do you mean your Parsha's Truma dream actually came true? Yes, this is for me a very important date. I checked later on, later on a calendar. It was this Parsha of the week. I got married to Anya. And this was the Parsha in 19... 48 after the war on the week you were born and so it came out to be this Parsha you sang on the Saturday of your bar mitzvah the next morning each from us got a Red Cross package and they loaded us on a train to Poland So, my son, now I see you are a Roe Hanoled, one who sees what the future will bring. Hey, this train seems to be passing Soznovic. When they didn't stop the train, I became very worried. You see, the Nazis divided Poland into pieces. Protectorate and Reich, with a guarded border in between. Those without papers for Krakow, out! And when it stopped in Warsaw, the rabbi got out. I'll write to you. I never heard again from him. It became such a misery. In Warsaw, almost none survived. And the train was a long way past Solznovic. So, they took they took me up, up very far, maybe 300 miles, until we came to Lublin. There, they unloaded all of us from the Reich. Maybe that's the Reich. I was very frightened. Then we heard something to give us a little hope. We have bribed the Germans to release prisoners into the homes of local Jews who will claim you as relatives. My name's Spiegelman. There's a friend of my family named Orbach in Lublin. I met him when I was here for army training. Fine, we'll try to register you as his cousin. That night, I went out from the tent. I had to urinate. I 
ran quick inside and thought all night different things that what could happen to us. Then, as soon as it was light, Spiegelman, Spiegelman, Vladik, Orbach, am I glad to see you? And in 10 minutes, I was free. Orbach was a friend from my uncle. He had two beautiful daughters near to my age. I'm sorry we can't offer you a better meal, Vladik, but the Jews of Lublin get very few food coupons. One moment, girls. I have a gift for each of you. Oh my God, chocolate. These I saved from a Red Cross package. Always, I saved just in case. Eventually, when I came again to Soznovic, we sent them food packages. We were for a while a little better off, and they wrote back, very happy, how it seemed, how it helped survive them. Then they wrote that the Germans were keeping the packages, and then they stopped to write, finished. With Orbex, I stayed a few days recuperating, but I was restless. How could I manage to sneak across the border to my family? Trains were still going from protectorate to Reich. Only one needed, only one needed legal papers. Of course, this I didn't have. But anyway, I got on the train in the direction I wanted. I approached to the train man, a pole. May I talk with you for a moment? Sure, soldier. You're a pole like me, so I can trust you. The stinking Nazis had me in a war prison. I just escaped. The Poles were very bitter on the Germans, so it was good to speak bad of them. I'm trying to get to Sosnovic, back to my family. Don't worry, when we get to the border, hide in here. And so the train man helped me come back to my side of Poland. I walked first over to my parents' house. What I thought I might, what I thought I might never see again. Oi! Gewalt, it's Vladik! My son, thank God you're safe. And in spite of everything, you look healthy. I'm strong, mother, but you look sick. It's because I was worried about you. But it wasn't only this. She was sick of cancer. And a month or two later, she died. She never knew how terrible everything would soon be. And father, your beard, what happened? You shaved it off. It's growing back now. He was very religious. So like a rabbi, and of course, so he was very religious, so like a rabbi. And of course, he always had a big beard. In September, the German soldiers grabbed many Jews in the street. They made us sing prayers while they laughed and beat us. And before letting us go, they cut off our beards. And now the demons have taken away my seltzer factory. They, enough! I must bring Vladik home to Anya before curfew. At seven, it was a rule. All Jews had to be in their home and all lights out. 
from my parents to Sosnovic was only a short ride. Go in and say, you just got a letter from me saying I'd be home in a week. I stood at the door listening. Don't joke. If Vladik was coming home, he'd have written us. He'd, he'd have written to us. He'd have written to us too. Surprise! Oh my God! Vladik! I grabbed my son. He was two and a half years. Rishu! Ba! Wa! He started screaming. Why do you cry, my boy? I'm your father. Wa! The buttons. You are metal buttons, Daddy. They're gold. And I don't need to tell you how big the joy was in our house. Even though everything was very tough, it was really very tough. We were happy only to be together. Not so like it is now with me and Marla. I tell you, if Anya could be alive now, it would be everything different with me. Mala makes me crazy. Only she talks about money. Always about my will. Please, stop. You always tell me the same things. There's nothing I can do. But I haven't with whom else to talk. And it's for you. I watch out my money. Jeez. Let's talk about it next time. I'll call you. Besides, it's getting late. I ought to get home before curfew. <laughs> hey, where's my coat? I know I put it here. Mala, did you put my coat someplace? No. Are you going now? I'll make you some coffee. No thanks, I'm not thirsty. And you make the worst coffee I've ever tasted. But I still, but I still have that bag of espresso you once left here. But that was over six months ago. That coffee's completely stale. So maybe some tea. No thank you, just my coat. Oh dad, have you seen my coat anywhere? Yes. I threw it out. What? You're kidding. Sorry. Give it back. It's too late. It's too late. When you were sitting first down to dinner, I threw it outside. By now the garbage men took it away. Such an old shabby coat. It's a shame my son should wear such a coat. But I like it. I have for you a warmer one. I got it at Alexander's. A new jacket. And I can give to you my old one. It's still uh, like new. Here, just try it on a minute. Oh, great. A Naugahyde windbreaker. It's too big. Ah, it looks like a million dollars. It looks on you like a million dollars. Look, Dad, you can't do this to me. I'm over 30 years old. I choose my own clothes. After you wear it a little, you'll see how good it looks. Come. I'll walk you downstairs. So don't forget, Artie. You'll call me this week, and we can talk. You really threw it out. My coat. I can't believe it. I 
just can't believe it. But that's the end of chapter three. <sighs> Funny times, right? That was back in the, that was back in, let's see, that was back in the 70s. Yes, if you do the math, Artie was born in the fifth, in the early 50s, and he's 30 years old now. So this is in, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, 70s or 80s. Anyway, we're going to move on to chapter four here.